not. Okay, so let's start again. 6 p.m. February, what's today? February 2nd, 2021. We're just having a, a chat about GameStop and some issues around it. I'm Professor Eric Senko. I teach at Santa Monica College and El Camino. I teach Intro to Business, Personal Finance, and Intro to Investments. I'd like to thank a few people who've given me a lot of help um, over my time at these schools and especially over the last week. Ian, who will uh, remain without a last name, current finance professional. Hung Wa, another friend of mine, equity finance and HFT guru. If you don't know what HFT is now, hopefully you will by the end of this lecture, even though I didn't put any slides in for it, whatever. Professor Chow at El Camino, Professor Veyas, at Santa Monica, Dr. Rapp, El Camino, Professors Pacioretty and Moore as well who've helped me. So thank you very much to all of you. I really appreciate the help. I, um, I just put this slide pack together today. So it's a bit brief and it's a little bit all over the place, but I was just trying to tailor it based on what kind of information you guys gave me in your survey. A little bit about me. I spent about 25 years working in finance. I worked in Chicago for six years doing listed derivatives, what we know as futures and options. I started in the cattle and hog and pork belly pits in Chicago. I did an MBA at the Univers University of Chicago. Then I moved to London where I traded pretty much every European and emerging like uh, Egypt and all kinds of and Czech Republic and Poland and all of that stuff. Then I moved over to Hong Kong where I traded pretty much every market in Asia. I worked for an investment bank, Credit Suisse, for a couple of years, and then worked for a hedge fund for a while. And then my buddy and I started our own hedge fund. He's in Hong Kong running it still. I left in 2013. Um, so we did. I did primarily merger arbitrage and special situations. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. It's not important. Long and short of it is I've had a lot of experience short selling in lots of different markets around the world, but I'm still learning. There's still tons and tons to learn. And that's why I love teaching because I learned so much from my students and my peers. So the fine print writ large for those of us who are older and have trouble seeing things. Like all of my classes, some of you have taken my classes before, a few of you haven't. In all of my classes, I like to have open discussion, right? I am not the repository of all knowledge. And for you to participate, I learn, you learn, your peers learn. So please feel free to participate whenever. You can share whatever level of personal information you are comfortable with. I'm not gonna ask you any kind of probing questions or if you don't wanna answer anything, just be like, mm, nah, not really comfortable with that. You can always do what I do and be like a friend of mine, like a friend of mine named Hung Wa bought GameStop at the top, right? And then people be like, oh, maybe it really was his friend or Mary, maybe Eric's a chump and bought it at 350, whatever, who knows? But you can always do that. Uh, just be respectful of others, their opinions. We can disagree, that's fine. In this scenario, there have been significant, significant movements Bear in mind, some people may have lost significant sums of money. It might not be significant for you, but it might be for them. So just keep that in mind, right? We're, we're all here to learn. This is always a constant process. Even the, the like market veterans are still learning, right? In my classes, I give people extra credit if they catch me out on something. So if I make a comment, something, you know, not, like if I say, oh, Volkswagen sold 15 million cars last year and they sold 13 million, that's not catching me out, right? But uh, is Sharon in here? Let me see, hold on, let me get the participants. Sharon, are you here? No, it doesn't look like it. Uh, you mean China. Shannon? No, 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 sorry. Uh, so Sharon was in, uh, Sharon's a friend of mine. She was in my class a few years ago. She tried to catch me out on this was when AOC shot down the Amazon headquarters in New York. And I made a comment that there were not going to be cash payments to Amazon as part of that um, deal that they were talking about. She disputed that. Uh, it turned out I was right. Uh, but if she had been right, I would have given her extra credit. 
for the class in the class and that's how i work right so i have no problem with people challenging challenging me i think nathan's in here nathan loved doing that he still loves doing that uh even though he's not taking any classes from me i think he just enjoys uh challenging me just for the fun of it so good on him um so i don't mind that right obviously this does not apply to finance professionals like hung Wong and ian or other professors so legal disclaimer this is not investment advice okay if you follow my advice, you are almost certain to lose money. Don't even think about doing it. You're smarter than that. Prove to me that you're smarter than that. Um, the bulk of my career in finance was in Europe and Asia. The regulations in Europe are specific country to country. Asia, they're just totally all over the place based on the country. And even then the rules don't always apply in the, the jurisdiction they say they do. The rules are always changing, particularly rules around short selling. We're going to talk about that. So this is stuff where, you know, I'm going to talk about my experience. I'm going to draw on a few friends who are in here, professionals, and they're going to chime in too. So it's entirely possible that I'll say something and someone will be like, oh, actually, that's not the case anymore, or it wasn't like that, or there was this or that. So again, there's, there are a lot of interesting nuances here. So what we should have time for tonight, and I budgeted two hours for this thing. My classes are usually three hours. I mean, we can kind of see how it goes. If you guys get tired of me, whatever. You know, if you have to log out or anything like that, no stress at all. Uh, talk about what stocks are, going long versus going short, shorting, regulations, ethics around that. Obviously, we'll talk about GameStop. Fairness, justice, sticking it to the man, and as always, talk about my rants against the federal reserve maybe some other time we'll be able to talk about options bitcoin interest rates inflation my rants about anything other than the federal reserve so the poll i think about 52 people replied have you traded stocks before over half said no okay so that's interesting to me it means there's there's a, a pretty um introductory level of knowledge here do you know what short selling is? Also half said no. So, okay. And this is the challenge I always have as a professor of investments because people all have sort of, on any given night, I'll have sort of 30 students, five to 10 of whom are trading their own stock portfolio, some of whom are trading options. And then I'll have another 10 students who are like, I, I don't know what a stock is. I've heard of the stock market. They talk about it on, on the news, but I don't really know what it is. And that's my challenge as a professor is how do you, you know, teach to groups as diverse as that, where you've got half the people kind of sitting around like, oh, seriously, and the other half like, wow, I'm totally lost. You know, he's going too fast. So it's, it's a bit challenging, I'll be honest. Um, the other topics we talk about in my class, personal loans, most people know a bit about that. They'll probably have some experience, but most people don't have much granular detail about it. So that makes it a bit easier. And then bonds, nobody knows about bonds before I teach them. And then they usually know even less after I teach them about bonds. So that's my failing as a professor, but we're working on that. What is a stock? What we call stock is actually ownership in a company, also known as equity. If you go to an investment bank, they'll have an equities division and a fixed income division. Equity is stocks. If you own a share of stock, you own a percentage of the company. If you buy one share in Apple, you own a tiny percentage of the company. Why would you do that? You expect or hope that the company will maybe pay a dividend which is they earn money and then they pay some of it out to the owners or that the company will be worth more in the future. The stock price will go up. That is, you want the company to do well. You bought a share in Apple computer, you want them to sell more iPhones. You want them to charge more for their iPhones. You want them to have greater market share, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The better the company does, the more your investment should be worth? Maybe not. And there are plenty of examples where companies are doing better and better and their stock price doesn't move. That's something that we're not really going to have time to go into today, but it does happen. And this is where smart investors, especially value type investors, 
look at something and say, hey, this company is doing better and better and better. They're making more money. They're making more sales. They've got more customers. People love their products, but their stock price isn't going up. Why is that? There are a number of reasons. There are myriad reasons. If you purchase a share or shares of stock, you're now long. That is known as being long. I am long Apple. What does that mean? Anyone can jump in. I, I, own, I own Apple stock. Exactly. You bought a share of Apple. You own Apple stock. You're now partial owner of the company. Congrats. So now what? Boom, that's it. You're done. Now you got to go on yachtbroker.com or whichever website, get a big ass yacht like that. And then remember, hopefully your favorite investments professor. Don't forget to invite me. I love being on boats, especially in the Mediterranean, right? Not so much in the Pacific. I don't see the point of that. Really? No, that's not it. Obviously not. As an owner, what are your responsibilities? You are now one of the owners of Apple computers. You must have some responsibility, right? You have to go into the office every day. You have to put a suit on. You have to wear heels and do your hair and put on lipstick and all that. You have to fill out TPS reports. No. Tom would say, come on, that's funny. TPS reports, right? Don't forget your cover sheet. No, okay. That's okay. No, with stocks, if you own a share, let's say Steve Jobs is still alive. Cause I don't know, what's the guy's name now? Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. You own a share of Apple. Is Tim Cook gonna call you up and be like, hey, Nass. What should I do? I want to sell more iPhones. Is he going to call up every single owner? No. If you own a share of stock, you vote for a board of directors who then selects managers, people to run the company. You do not run the company yourself if you are a shareholder. It separates the owners from the managers. Now, in my class, we go into greater detail as to why this can be problematic. Because these two groups, the owners and the managers, they might have different objectives. They might have different time frames. They might do things differently. The owners might want an action A that benefits them. The managers might say, you know what, we're going to go with action B, which benefits us as managers. Now, that's it for going long a stock, buying a stock. What questions do you guys have? You can either speak uh, in your microphone. You can pop, I'll open up the chat here. You can pop it in the chat. Someone's got to have some questions on this. I have a question. Yes. Hi there. Uh, thank you for having this class. My name is Aksana and I have a question about dividends. Uh, I know that some uh, companies do pay them and some don't. And I was wondering what does it depend on? It depends on what they want to pay. There is, to the best of my knowledge, and Aaron's probably a better uh, person to ask on this. As far as I know, a company is not obligated to pay any sort of dividend. I'm not familiar with anything off the top of my head. That's so, correct. There's no requirement. Right. So a company is not required to pay any sort of dividend. Now, if we step back and think about it, you own, a sh you own a share of Apple, right? Mm -hmm. and you paid, what's, what's Apple at now? Let's see. Uh, um, 100 something, maybe 300? I think 135. Yeah, okay. So Apple, 135 a share. You buy one share. Now let's say Apple makes a profit of $10 per share. You're an owner. What do you want them to do with that? What reinvested in more stock? I'm sorry, Jennifer? Reinvested in more shares? Can you reinvest your profit into more no, shares? No, no, no. Let, let's say Apple makes the profit, right? The oh, okay. cash is sitting in the company still. Okay, Corey says R&D. Tom says, give me the money. Those are two different things. They could do either of those. Corey says R&D. Corey, why do you want Apple to put the money into R&D?
They can come up with better products. They can make more money. They can do, they, obviously they're pretty good at using their money, right? Apple's pretty good at what they do. Of course, like do more of that and you'll make me more money. Tom is like, hey, you know what? You made $10 profit. I've got to pay my mortgage. So give me the money. Those are two of the main things that companies do with cash that they have as profit. They can also go and buy back their shares, which is similar to uh, a dividend. It's a bit different, but it has a similar effect in that shareholders can benefit from that because it pushes up the price of their stock. So what are some other people saying? Paying some out. Da, 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 generate new revenue. How are dividends typically paid out? Dividends generally are paid out quarterly. Right, Aaron? Aaron again, Aaron's an accounting prof. She's the guru on all this stuff. Now, <clears throat> let me go back to the original question here. Apologies. Yeah, quarterly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm holding the baby. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's baby time for everyone. Now, Oksana, your original question. Uh, what does it depend on? Yeah, so it basically depends on what the company is going to do. What do the managers and owners want? Some companies keep the cash on their balance sheet. I think Apple has like billions of dollars on their balance sheet, right? And I right. think they invest it in stocks and stuff. A Apple actually has a, has a large hedge fund. Michael, mm -hmm. they can pay off their debts. I mean, you can you can use that cash for numerous different things. But they do pay like, their um, like CEO gets dividends, right? Tim Cook, he would get dividends quarterly. If he uh, if he has shares, his uh -huh. shares are presumably the same as everyone else's shares, and we're going oh. to talk about that later on. Okay. Now, as the CEO, he would get a salary and a bonus. And I, I don't know his actual compensation, but he uh -huh. probably has some sort of salary and then a bonus, which has, I'm guessing, a cash component and a share component or share options. I don't know off the top of my okay. head. And yeah. is there a certain amount of, um, so there is totally, there is 100% of stocks, you know, and do they allow people to buy up to a certain amount or because I can go there, you know, if I have billions of dollars and I can buy 51% of uh, Apple stock, does it make me dictate to, what to do? Great question. Now, this is something that varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And this is actually the business I was in. So merger arbitrage, when one company is buying another. And the way it works is, and this actually is interesting when we, when we start talking about GameStop and Reddit is, certain jurisdictions that I worked in, once you hit 20%, once you own 20% of the company, you have to make an offer to buy the entire company. So oh. you can own 2%, 3%, et cetera. And then once you own 20%, it's like, okay, what's the highest price you've paid to buy your stock? You have to offer everyone that price. That's called a mandatory takeover which prevents someone from just kind of basically buying up the company little by little by little by little. It's trying to treat all investors fairly. I wonder if, some, if there's somebody who owns 19% then. <laughs> but, I mean, probably not of Apple. And generally, you know, I don't have access to Bloomberg anymore, but you can see these things. You, most of this, all of these things, um, you can find, um, you just look top holders, uh, Vanguard, the mutual fund owns 7%. They're the top holder. Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's vehicle owns 5.5% of Apple. Right. So you can, that stuff's pretty easy to see. Right. And Thank again, you so much. Regulatory requirements. Any, any other questions before we move on to shorting? Adam, thank you for uh, that. I have a question. Yes. Who's this? Uh, hi. Um, uh, Shannon Morris. Okay. Go ahead, Shannon. Hi. Uh, thank you. So I have a question back to that um, dividend um, question. So is it um, is it right to assume that if a company starts paying out dividends that they're kind of capped out to how much growth that they can have? They no longer um, research and development. They no longer put money towards that because they're kind of done with that. So they pay out dividends. Is that right to assume? No, 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 no. I wouldn't assume that. Um, there are, you know, it, it's kind of a an odd thing. Exxon 
just came out and they are maintaining their dividend. They had a massive loss. They're maintaining their dividend. I, I think these kinds of companies you get, it's, it's a very sort of optical thing like, oh, we, we don't want to cut our dividend. So we've been paying out whatever, 10 cents a share every quarter for the last, you know, 137 years, we don't want to cut that because that sends a bad signal to people, whatever. Um, and, you know, in, in my class, we get into a lot more detail about things like this where companies, you know, I'm from San Diego, Qualcomm borrowed $10 billion and then said, oh, we're going to pay a $10 billion dividend. Okay, well, that, if you have to wow. borrow money to pay a dividend, you're, you're not you know, the original purpose of the dividend was you're paying out some of the profits you made. If you have to borrow money to pay mm -hmm. your dividend, which, which a bunch of companies do now. So this is, these are the things where finance has changed drastically in the past 10, 15 years. You know, again, I always blame the Federal Reserve. That's my, uh, my bet noir, if you will, in finance. So what if you dislike a company? Maybe you think the company is a bad investment. You don't like their business model. You don't think the value of the, or you do think the value of the company will decrease. You have a few alternatives. Well, just don't buy their stock. But what if you go, you know what? Their stock's going to go down. This is a terrible company. I want to make money if it goes down. You can do something called shorting. Shorting a stock is taking a bet that the company will go down in value. Are there any companies, I have to go, I have to load something up here from the next slide. Can you guys tell me companies that you dislike or think will go down in value? Uh, I wouldn't say dislike, Nicola. but GoPro. GoPro, why GoPro? GoPro doesn't have a, a very, I mean, they have a strong product for their cameras, but they don't have anything else. And that's been their problem in the past when they've come up with new products. It's really just been a flop and they haven't really found that niche other than cameras. Okay. Oh. So let's look at, and, and then this is what we always do in my class is we sit here and we say, okay, what, what's the ticker? Is it G Pro? Uh, I believe so, yeah. So here's GoPro. Oh, they were at two bucks a share. They've rallied up to 10. Now, obviously when they IPO'd, when they came out in 2014, the stock was at 85 bucks a share, right? So this is a stock that's that's had some, you know, apparently they were gonna change the world and apparently not, right? Now it's rallied. And sorry, who was that that was talking? Was that Michael? Yeah, that was me, yeah. Okay, right? So he's like, hey, you know what? I think this stock is overvalued. I think it's gonna go down. Kelly, Uber and Lyft. Hey, I've got a car that drives itself. I don't need to take a lift now. I can go out and have 16 cocktails and get in my autonomous car and go home, right? Okay. Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Eileen says GNC, Bed Bath & Beyond. Keep those in mind. Those are very applicable to what we're talking about. Exxon. Right. Okay. So a lot, you guys all have good, I, I like this. You guys all have good ideas. Now we're going to, we're going to do something here. And those of you who've taken my course know how much I love the Simpsons. This is Mr. Burns who gets pissed off at his financial advisors because the last time he checked his stock portfolio was right before the uh, stock market crash in 1929. So this is, this is him now coming up with a new plan. Let's put an aggressive trading strategy. Good idea, yeah, sir. Take 50% of my money and put it in the blue chips. Transatlantic Zeppelin, amalgamated spats, Congreves, and flammable powders, U.S. hay, and sink the rest into that up and coming Baltimore Opera Hat Company. I don't see it, Eric. Does everybody else see it? Enable. You guys can't see it? No, we got it. Adam says he sees it. It's a, it's a me problem. I see it. Did everyone else see it? No, I, I see it and hear it. It works great. Okay. So, what, right, what, were, the, what were the companies Monty Burns recommends?
transatlantic Zeppelin Corporation, amalgamated spats. Actually, this is what a spat is, for those of you who, like me, had no idea what it was. Tom probably knows what spats are, but the rest of us, it's these things you put over your shoes. I don't know. I guess they were possible. Of course, every fine, fine uh, dressed gentleman would know that. So we've agreed. We all, it's actually kind of funny how quickly you guys came up with stocks that you don't like. So the mechanics of shorting. You found a stock that you think will go down in value. Let me grab my wallet. It was supposed to be here. Sorry. Okay. Step one. You borrow. Hold on. feedback here. There we go. Okay. All right. So you found a stock you think will, you will go down. Step one, you borrow the shares from someone who has them. Now, when you borrow something from anyone, like money for a loan or a rental car, or whatever, you have to pay them a fee for the time that you use it. Borrowing a share of stock is no different. You now have that share of stock. And sorry, this is a lot easier to explain in my in-person class. You then take that share, you sell it in the market. Let's say like GameStop, it's at 200 bucks a share. You've received $200 cash. So when you started, before you started, what did you have? You had nothing. You borrow a share of stock from someone, you have a share of stock and you owe it to that person. You go in the market, you sell it. When you sell something, someone normally gives you cash for it, right? So you sell the stock in the market at $200 a share. So you get 200 bucks. Hopefully, if you were right, the price falls. Let's say it falls to $100. Now you go back into the market, you buy a share of stock, you pay $100 for it. Now you, what do you have? Profit. You have a share of stock, you have $100, and you have to give that stock back to the person from whom you borrowed it. You keep doing that either until you buy a yacht or a bunch of people on Reddit get together and team up on you and blow up your fund. Questions? So uh, I have a question. What prevents the company from issuing more shares? Like just because Reddit doesn't want to sell their shares, isn't there nothing preventing the company itself from issuing more shares out to make money at that new uh, overinflated totally, price? Totally correct. And I don't, now with companies, you, you generally, if you have treasury stock and Aaron probably knows more about this or Professor Chow, there's still a process, but I, I think it's a lot quicker to issue treasury stock than actual filing a new uh, share issue. But in, in my mind, GameStop should have, I mean, look at what Tesla did, right? The stock runs up and Tesla's like, oh, we're gonna sell $5 billion worth of stock. They sell it and get 5 billion cash. Tesla runs up another 300%. They're like, oh, we're gonna sell $10 billion worth of stock, right? GameStop, I think if GameStop had, had done that, the stock, would have gone down a lot more quickly than it did, but I don't know why they didn't. I mean, that to me, like if you're the CEO of GameStop, but I don't know, is the guy like on vacation or asleep or I don't know what he's doing, right? But they should have been out there like selling stock in the market and raising cash. We're gonna go into GameStop later on. And then but subsequently follow up a question on that. What, I understand the hedge funds that were already on short positions that they were upside down on. Wait, sorry, do this. Sorry, say that again more slowly. So, so I understand that the hedge funds that already had the shorts in place were already at existing obligations, but if one or two hedge funds, they're relatively small compared to the overall uh, market. Like for instance, if BlackRock and their $8 trillion was like at $300, this is obviously overpriced. It's a sure thing to short at that point. What stopped the whole idea of, well, we can screw whilst 
great doesn't really make sense because there's so much money money that you can you can get over on an individual to kind of make a point but there's so much more money behind the wall that it doesn't seem like it's feasible to artificially inflate a uh, pump and dump basically great question let's hold that till we finish shorting and we're going to do some look at some graphs and we'll, we'll think about that okay hey eric i have a, a question yes who's this this is Corey. Corey, go ahead yeah um hi so uh, how can a company uh be shorted more than 100 percent of their available shares on the market we'll talk about that in a bit great question the short answer rehypothecation we'll come back to that okay, great thanks question. we'll talk about that with gamestop um what is required for shorting? Fungibility. Anyone ever heard that term? Anyone ever borrowed $20 from your friend, stolen $20 out of your mom's wallet? This is being recorded, so think before you answer that one. No. <laughs> right, answer. right answer. When you borrow $20 from a friend and you pay them back, hopefully, what do you give them? If I give you this $20 bill and a week later, you give me this $20 bill. Plus am I, interest. Am I, plus interest. Am I fine with that? Yes. Why? Because all $20 bills have the same value. It doesn't matter which $20 bill. It's a $20 bill. Exactly. They're fungible. Each one has the same value as the other, right? Shares of stock, assuming it's the same stock, Apple common stock with the ticker AAPL, they're all the same. And if I borrow a share of Apple from Anna and we agree a fee that I will pay her, I wanna borrow it for one month and I will pay you 1% of the value. As long as I give her back a share of AAPL at the end of the month, she doesn't care which share it is because they're all the same. Right? Now, this is where common stock is a lot easier to short than something like bonds. Apple might have bonds, but they'll have 50 different bonds and they're not fungible. Each issue of a bond, the June of 2023, 5.5%, those are all fungible but they're not fungible with the July of 2025, 3%, right? So the bond market is a lot more difficult. The bond market's basically like stuck in the 1980s, right? That's why they make so much money. The stock market is a bit different. Now, why would Anna lend me her stock? She knows I'm gonna short it. Isn't she just hurting herself? she a masochist? Anna, you don't have to answer that question. Can I interject? Yeah, of course, anyone. Maybe okay. So, sorry, I just got off work. Yeah, so like answer about I've been listening. <laughs> but um, if if you're borrowing my short, as long as I'm getting it back, I don't really care what you do with it, I'm going to get the same thing back. Yeah. And you might have a two, five, 10 year view, right? Anna mm -hmm. might have a long-term view. Hey, you know what? I bought this stock. They are just going to crush Samsung. They're going to take over the world. Da, da, da. They're going to have driving, self-driving cars, this and that, et cetera. Plus I get paid, you know, whatever, 1% a month, 2% a month. Sure. Eric's going to take it and short it. Net, net, that is going to cause extra selling pressure which will cause the stock to go down, but whatever, I don't care. It's gonna go, there, go down. Professor, is there a risk to the lender? I mean, they're gonna, they know they're gonna short it, but what if they're wrong or they don't make the profit? What happens then? Who is they? The lender. So the, the lender in this case is Anna. Anna owns the stock. She bought the stock. She loves the company. She lets me borrow it so that I can short sell it. So 
what is your question then? Is there ever a, a a opportunity or a moment where they're wrong on the short sell and they lose money and they're not able to return the the share of stock as is or the the one percent? Okay, so I'm wrong. I've borrowed the money. I've shorted the stock, and now it's gone straight up in my face. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. That's so what's, exactly, like, that's isn't there exactly. a risk to the lender? Um, generally not, no, because the stock's still in the system. It's not like they mail the certificates out to people's homes, and then I take the stock, and then I go to Barbados, and they never hear from me again. Right. right? So, the risk would be with the borrower or to the short seller, because regardless if the stock goes up or down, you have to return back the stock to Anna. So the risk is really for the short seller, not the, the lender. Exactly. That makes sense. Exactly. Now, the risk there is risk to the lender in this kind of whole system wide risk when we're talking about things like rehypothecation, re which we'll touch on in a bit. But that's more of a of something that's known as counterparty risk, right? What if you lend me money, you have risk that I just disappear and go to, I wouldn't go to Barbados, I'd go to Colombia, but you know, so look for me there if you're ever, if I ever owe you a lot of money. Thoughts, questions on that? Hold on, let me read the, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, let me just to think. Da, 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 da. So Marcy's comment, what value is it for the person or company that lent the stock? They give a stock and then receive it back at a lesser value. It seems to be a lose, losing scenario for the one that lends the stock. In theory, but generally, Anna would have done this because she has a longer term view on something. So she's not going to be too swayed by the movements if it moves 5% down. Maybe she will buy more, maybe she won't. Right. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Michael, we're going to go into that very shortly. Okay, now let's take a, a little break here and do I prepared this whiteboard. Everyone see the whiteboard? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm draw some lines here. Now, GameStop is at $200 a share. If you buy the stock right now and it goes up to $201 a share, do you have a profit or a loss? Profit. A profit, Jennifer. How much? A dollar. You've made a dollar. So if you went over here to 201, then you would go up one. What happens if it goes to 202? You go up one more. You're here. What happens if you bought it at 200 and it goes down a dollar? Stock's at 199. You'd go to the loss. You'd lose a dollar. What happens if the stock goes to 100? You're huh? sad. You're sad, true. We can't draw a little, I guess we could draw a sad face on this graph but we're looking for something a bit more mathematical. What would your profit or loss be? Obviously you have a loss if you're sad. You have um, a loss of $100. You would lose $100. So what you would do is you would have a graph that looks more or less like that. And we will say here, what is your position on the screen line? Are you long or short? Long is when you buy stock or sell stock. A long is when you buy it and you have it for a while, right? It doesn't have to be a while, but whatever. You have purchased stock. You are long stock. This is a slope of one. For every dollar the stock goes up, you make a dollar. For every hundred dollars it goes up, you make a hundred dollars. That is your payoff graph if you're long. You bought it 200, you want it to go up. 
what is the most amount of money you can lose if you buy the stock at 200? The most amount is $200 loss if, you, if your investment or initial purchase is $200. The most amount of money you can ever lose is $200. If the stock goes to zero, well, you've lost 200 bucks. What's the most amount you can make? Infinite. It's infinite in theory, right? Those people who bought Amazon back in the day at 25 cents, 50 cents a dollar, but they probably have yachts right now. So your max loss is what you pay for. it. Your max gain is unlimited. Questions on that? You know what? This stock sucks. GameStop is terrible. It's going to go down. So we're going to short it. If we short it at $200 and the stock goes to $199, do we make money or lose money? A dollar. A dollar we made or lost? Anna? You made a dollar if it goes down. If it goes down $50, made $50. You made $50. What if it goes up $50? Then you're sad. <laughs> you're sad. <laughs> Meaning it's a loss. So we have lines here. What do you think of that? What is the most amount of money you can ever make if you short a stock at $200? 200 bucks? Michael, what's the most amount of money you can lose if you short a stock at $200? As high as the stock goes, it's infinite. Yeah, if it keeps going, then you're gonna be out that much. However high it climbs. Exactly. Infinite. I can't, I don't have the, I don't have my pad, so I can't draw the little infinity symbol. But same thing. Your loss in theory could be infinite. This goes back to the question that I can't remember who it was asked earlier. Why couldn't you just, you know, keep shorting and keep shorting? Anyone ever heard of Volkswagen? No, nobody. The company that makes cars that. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, what's happening with GameStop happened in Volkswagen in like 2009. The stock went to, I think it was, went from like 150 euros to, no. Was it, was it the awards or the press? Yeah, you see this? Basically, in a short period of time, the stock went from like 150 euros to, I think it went to over 1,000 euros. Now, obviously, Volkswagen's like the largest car company in the world. They make 10, 15 million cars a year. The value of the company did not increase five to sevenfold in the period of a week. This was a technical Thing related to Porsche buying a relatively illiquid share class. This guy, Adolf Merkel, was started shorting it. And we all looked at this. I was in London at the time, and the stock goes from whatever 150 to 250. And we're like, okay, obviously that's that's crap. It's a good short. And then it goes to 350, 500, 700. What happened? This guy at the time was the 90 fourth richest man in the entire world. He committed suicide after he lost a bunch of money on Volkswagen. Did Volkswagen go back down? Absolutely. Didn't help him, did it? Fortunately, I haven't heard of any suicides related to this yet. But this is the kind of thing, when you look at this chart, 
oh, you know what? GameStop's like, $200 a share. It's a crappy company that sells video games in malls. Who the hell goes to the mall anymore? Nobody. Oh, I'm going to short some. I'm going to short $10,000 worth. Okay. Now you're down five grand. Now you're down 10 grand. Now you're down 20 grand. It's still a crappy company. Yeah, probably. But you're down $20,000 now. What are you going to do? You're going to sell some more? Right. Do you have the money to sell more? Thoughts, questions, comments? I have a question. Yes, who's this? Hi. Uh, Shannon again. Um, uh, so about going short and going long. So going long can be uh, is finite loss with infinite gain potentially and going short is um, finite gain and infinite loss. I'm just wondering what is the benefit of going short with so much risk? Great question. Great question. You know, and this is the interesting thing when we talk about, you know, this antipathy towards short sellers is generally short sellers, assuming you're not doing uh, the expression to like, if you guys have ever seen Wolf of Wall Street, right, that that whole idea is called a pump and dump. Hey, we're going to get some small little penny stock. We're going to buy a bunch and then we're going to call everyone we know. I mean, I've got like whatever, 2,000 students in my database. Imagine if I bought a little stock and then emailed all 2,000 of my students, holy shit, this stock's amazing, you guys gotta buy it. And they all go in and buy it and then I sell them the stock I bought. That's totally illegal, that's called a pump and dump. You can do that on the short side. Oh my God, GameStop, the CEO was you know, smoking crack and you know, like uh, doing whatever. Right? Oh my God, like, you know, that, that's illegal. Now, that aside, if we're not talking about that, which we would call short and distort, I've heard the term, the, the opposite of pump and dump. If you're talking about like, hey, you know what? Here's a company that, I mean, it's GameStop, right? Like who the hell goes to the mall anymore? Who buys used video games? Well, we're gonna look at that in a little bit. Yet yeah, this company's gone up quite a bit. And you guys all listed a bunch of stocks, Macy's, Bed Bath & Beyond, et cetera, et cetera. There are legitimate reasons why these companies probably are not doing well and why their stock price could or should go down. Right? Yes, you are taking on that risk. Now, generally, does anyone expect to be attacked by a mob of you know, guys living in their mom's basement, you know, plugging away $500 in their Robinhood account? No, but you know, it is a risk, sure. Again, I'm just repeating the things the Redditors say about themselves, right? They all go in for their attendees and stuff like that. Regulations around this, particularly short selling, are always changing. Now, I, I spent five or six years in Asia. Some of the countries don't even allow it. China, when I was there, you are not allowed to short sell. You're not allowed to do synthetic shorting. You're not allowed to benefit from the price going down. Some countries restrict it pretty heavily. Taiwan, Korea at the time had very strict uh, regulations on it. Some like, you know, what are you gonna do? Short a stock in Indonesia? Yeah, good luck with that. Then you go to Bali on holiday and get arrested probably, right? Who knows? So these are things that are always changing. And in periods of market stress, which we saw in like 2008, 2009, sentiment turns against short sellers. It's their fault the stock market's going down. It's because of short sellers that the market crashed in 2008, 2009. Yes, no, what do you guys think? What did you say? Can you repeat that? Like the whole lecture or just the question I asked? Oh, just that question. <laughs> If we look at 2008, 2009, the stock market collapsed. It collapsed in 2000. Was that the fault of short sellers? Um, no, that was over leveraged uh, homeowners and a few other things. Yeah, right. There, there were serious, <laughs> serious underlying economic problems, right? That could not go on forever, right? I, a, a great movie to, uh, to watch is The Big Short. Anyone seen that? 
when you're watching that, pay attention to the scene where Steve Carell and his buddies, they're in the, in the strip club and they're talking to that dancer. And she's like, oh yeah, I've got this home and this and that, and I refinance it, but I can't really afford it, this and that. He's like, oh, so your one home has this issue. And she's like, oh no, I own six. And he's like, you own six homes that you like basically can't afford the mortgage on and you're just expecting the market to go up and that's gonna save you? She's like, yeah. Right? And then he gets out of that meeting. He's like, this thing's all going to collapse, right? That's not the fault of short sellers. Do they exacerbate it? Maybe. Do they mitigate some of the effects? Also true. We don't have time to go into all of that, but these are some of the things. So what do you think about shorting? You guys all seem to be, from what I could see on the chat. Hold on, let me go back here. Why isn't my chat showing up? What's going on here? Hold on, give me one second, sorry. There we go, now my chat's back. Back to our questions. Sorry, my computer's like 10 years old. So. Oh, is that sponsored by SMC? What? Your oh, computer. No, 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 I, I bought this one. I, Lived in Hong Kong, I just never upgraded. So if I go back here, Did you so we look at Exxon, uh, Tesla, you know, um, dun, 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 other stocks, Bed Bath & Beyond, Xerox, GNC, Zoom, Uber, Lyft, Macy's, right? You guys all have a negative opinion on this. You might be short sellers. Is it wrong to short sell? Kishani? I think if you can bet for the gains, you should be able to bet for the losses. This is the interesting thing. That's a very good point, right? Like what, what, is, what is wrong with betting that a stock's gonna go down? Is that un-American? It's America. Is it public information to short? Public information to short, I'm not quite sure what exactly you're asking so yeah. go ahead yeah. go i ahead. mean you said that you could tell like vanguard owns seven and a half percent of apple that's public um that's something that everyone can sort of see um is that information available when a company or an institution um shorts great question i don't know the answer to that in the u.s now, in, so I did in London, if a stock is subject to a takeover, if you have a position long or short greater than, I believe it's half a percent of the company, you have to update your position. You have to publish your position every day. That's only a stock that's under a takeover. Then you have reporting requirements based on, it's, I think it's usually like 5%. But if you want to short, you know, let's say you're a fund and you want to short half a percent of a company, you might not have to declare that. But you don't have to declare it if you buy half a percent either. So um, Eric, and to answer your first question is, um, anybody who's gone to Vegas, play the craps table, it's my favorite. The short sellers are the folks that bet on the no pass line. Mm. Boo. Everybody hates them. Boo. But that's who they are. <laughs> so they win a lot. Yeah, the odds are in your favor there, generally. So this is, this is something to think about, right? And this is where it's easy to just be like, oh, the short seller is this, the short seller is that. You know, in Italy, they banned short selling after 2008. Oh, these short sellers are spreading false rumors about our, our banks in Italy saying that they're crap. Well, the banks in Italy were crap, right? And they still are, in fact, right? That's not the fault of the short sellers. Maybe the short sellers were exaggerating. Maybe they were giving out misleading information, sure. But I've seen enough company presentations to see when companies are giving out positive misleading information too. So just something to think about. 
Now, anyone heard of Enron? Yes. Tesla? Presumably everyone's heard of Tesla. Anyone heard of Wirecard? No. This was very- Yeah, that is one. Sorry, who was that? Yeah, Wirecard, I heard of them recently. So back here, sorry, I have to do all this. The wire card. Come here, just go and take care of this feedback. Hold on, sorry. It's like uh, Close Encounters music here. Trying to mute. There we go. Okay. All right. Back to where we were. Wirecard, a German uh, like fintech payments processing, whatever company, right? Stock currently at 30 cents. Where was it a year ago? Oh, it was at 80 euros a share. Right? Does that look like a healthy company right there? No. no, no, absolutely not. There was massive, basically this whole company was fake. So what they were doing, and again, Professor Aaron Moore, who's on here, she's on here still, hopefully. Um, still here, still here. As, as our audit guru. So their auditors, which, who was it, Aaron? Do you know, PwC, maybe? I'm not sure. Long and the short of it, they were getting audited regularly. They were a multi-billion dollar German company, part of the DAX or something like that. And they were getting audited, you know, whatever, once a year, twice a year, whatever. And they'd be like, oh, do you guys have any bank accounts? And they go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a, a bank account in the Philippines with like $4 billion in it. Okay, can we see that? Oh, here's a screenshot of our like account details. And they basically like, sent them a PDF screenshot and the auditor was like, oh, okay, cool. So some investigative reporters, I think at the Financial Times started digging into this and they're like, this company seems fake. The German regulator got pissed off at the reporters and tried to get them busted for like fraud and stuff like that. Some short sellers got a hold of it, whatever. Long and the short of it, the Philippine Central Bank's like, that much money has never come into any banks from any of these companies. And then the actual Philippine banks were like, yeah, we don't even have accounts for them. So I don't know what they're saying with several billion dollars on deposit here, right? So this whole thing was a fraud. Right? Now, would that have been uncovered? Should that have been uncovered? You, know, you can thank the short sellers, people performing due diligence, whatever for things like that. Now. If, if this company were legit and people were spreading false rumors, hey, you know, again, the CEO smoking crack, whatever, that's an issue. That's kind of market manipulation. And again, different jurisdictions have different rules. In the UK, it's much more broad. You are not allowed to commit market manipulation. They don't define what it is exactly. So that gives the regulator a lot more latitude to prosecute people for something like that. Whereas in the US, you might, I don't know the exact rules in the US, but I think they're a lot more specific. You're not allowed to do A, B, or C. And you can be like, oh, well, I did like D. Technically not illegal. So they, I personally, I feel they do perform a service, short sellers in the market. Professor, may I ask a question? Please. Has, so um, I'm very new to all of this, so I'm sorry if it's not the smartest question. No, no, but no, no. <laughs> So short selling, I'm guessing, has been around since the dawn of investments or because it just seems like it's getting a lot of attention now because of the Robin Hood and the GameStop. But what makes the short selling going on now different than all of the short selling that's been happening, you know, since the dawn of Wall Street or however I would say it. So think of short selling as agreeing to deliver something that you do not have possession of. 
I don't own something. I will give you this or promise to give you this. How long has that been around? Well, short selling as we know it, I honestly don't know. I'd have to look into it. Um, what makes this different? I don't think this is different. Hmm. Well, and when we talk about GameStop, which we're going to now, we'll see. I don't think this is very different. And I, you know, obviously this story is developing the situation. We're learning stuff all the time about this. You know, it thus far, it doesn't seem all that it's portrayed to be, which is often the case. So let's talk about GameStop. And again, I, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but basically half of the people who are here don't know what shorting is, have never traded stocks, et cetera, et cetera. So th there's, a, there's a significant chunk of people who do not have any experience in this, which is, so, which is fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So GameStop. Who are they? What do they do? What do you think of the business? We won't go too much into this. Can you guys see this okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, good. Yeah. So this is GameStop's revenues from, I think, 2005. So basically, for about six or seven years, hold on, let's see, someone's just texting me. Da, 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 da. I'm just trying to get that thing. Hold on one second. These are their revenues. So for about like six years, they were doing about $9 billion of sales per year. Then 2017, it dropped to eight. <laughs> Is that the GameStop CEO? No, I don't think so, Tom. Right now, obviously pandemic. Is anyone going to the mall? No, right? No. Those, anyone here a gamer? Yes. Who, who's that? Who said yes? Jennifer. Okay. What What do you What do you play? Uh, Call of Duty and some trivia games, and some silly games. Tetris. Okay. Where do you Where do you purchase your games? <laughs> um, I'm so old school, so I'm still going to GameStop, but um, the other people in my household download games. Okay. So this is the thing, right? Everything else. You know, where do you buy your books? Where do you buy most of your stuff? You do it online, right? So, you know, as a short seller, if you look at this and go, okay, well, this is a business that was already kind of having some structural issues. Now the pandemic has kind of whacked the revenues almost in half. You're kind of like $5 billion a year. Or sorry, is this a quarter? Da, 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 da. Oh yeah, no, no, this is trailing 12 months, right? So this is annualized, right? So like $5 billion a year. Well, you can see negative growth, right? Okay, well, that's kind of the rationale for, for the people who decided to put this short on. Pre the madness, we will call it, and this is 2003 to 2019. Stock started out under 10 bucks, went to 60, market crashes, it goes down goes back to 50. And then this is, you know, if you look at all of the, the retailers, you look at, you know, GNC, you look at Macy's, you look at a lot of these companies that had lots of um, uh, square footage, large footprints, right? You see this among a lot of companies. And with a few of my professor colleagues, we talk about all these companies that have file for bankruptcy, right? Neiman Marcus, I don't know if Macy's is filed, you know, the, I, the other ones escape me, but tons of these companies have gone through bankruptcy. So like, oh, okay, you know, are we gonna go short this company? Well, yeah, there's probably a pretty good argument for why this company is not going to do well. Then all of this stuff starts happening. Now the stock's kind of like, you know, going up to 20 bucks and then it just goes completely tonto and goes up to Hungwa. Where did you buy it? Right about there? Hungwa still here? He probably logged off because he was, he's in tears. Oh, 450, he says, <laughs> right? So, you know, that's kind of the situation. Now, what would cause this stock 
Now, Feng Hua says he's ashamed of himself. What we would say is people will be drawing a line through your print for years, right? So that's kind of cool. What would cause this stock to go from 25 bucks to $500 in the space of, what is that? Geez, two to three weeks? Is there anything possibly fundamental related to the company that, has, that could cause this? A new game, right? Okay, we have a game and this game is called, you know, Crack of Duty and it comes with a vial of crack. And now every gamer is addicted to crack and they have to buy it more and more, whatever, I don't know, right? Some sort of new service. Potential acquisition. Maybe someone's gonna buy them, okay. Right. So new yeah, CEO. Uh, new CEO, right? You can think of reasons that a stock would rally. Oops. Here's one of my memes that I created myself. What was the reason this stock rallied like this? The Reddit users? Yeah, so GameStop didn't have anything genuinely related to the company that caused this other than, as Adam says, dank stonk memes. Right now, the short interest, meaning the percentage of sh of stock that was short, was one hundred and forty percent. That's the number getting thrown around. I think that was pretty accurate. There's a short report that comes out. I think every two weeks, and it says this company has X percentage of stock short. Well, one hundred and forty percent is a lot. So let's look at. most shorted stocks. So I think it comes out every two weeks. GameStop, 121, Dillard's, right? Is that Aileen that said Macy's? So one of their peers, 94%. AMC Entertainment, another one of these stocks, 78. Virgin Galactic, Fubo TV, I've heard of that. I don't know what they do. Bed Bath & Beyond. Right. Right. So there are a few that are like, you know, 50% of the company is short. But this is genuinely an outlier. This was at 140%. Tootsie roll. Oh my God. <laughs> Tom, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> tootsie roll. Everybody's got to go out and buy some Tootsie roll. Oh, Baba, that's what they last forever, right? We could just squirrel them away and, you know, like Zombie Land. I watched, you know, <laughs> like Twinkies. Okay, I'm off. I have no idea what you're talking about, but that's Tootsie Roll was on the list for most oh, shorted. Tootsie Roll is a yeah. short list. It's, it, but it never goes bad. So your stock, yeah, like, your, your inventory <laughs> acquisition would be great, you know? You're like, hey, I didn't even know that was a company. There you go. Okay, so to see something. Thank you very, thank you very much, Adam. You and I will get together. We got a couple of bucks. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna. Eric, we are sending you tootsie rolls. They're candy. Exactly. Dude. It's gonna be like I silver. Know, I know what they silver. are. Silver last as long as a tootsie roll. We get tootsie rolls. We'll put them in a vault. It'll be great. I didn't know it was a listed company. Fascinating. I didn't know anyone ate tootsie rolls anymore, other than at the dollar store ahead of Halloween. Anyway, um, so you can see that this was a bit of an outlier. And what appears to have happened, or what the story is, that some pretty smart people, look at GME, somehow, not somehow, it's not rocket science, but they go, hey, you know what? This is a small company. A lot of people are short, or not a lot of people, a lot of shares are short, way too many. Well, more shares are short than are actually of the company. So maybe we can try and engineer some kind of a short squeeze. Who's heard that term? A short squeeze. Anyone? 
So remember, when I was borrowing the stock from Anna, <clears throat> I have agreed to pay her a fee and I have to give her the stock back. What is also in that arrangement is that Anna at any time can say, hey, Eric, I need the stock back. You have three days to give it back to me. That's, that's what's known as a recall. So I just want to stop you there for a second, Eric. I mean, the question was, and I was trying to type it in the chat, and of course, fat fingers and all that kind of stuff. How can you possibly short more than the stocks that are outstanding? That's again, we'll get we'll get to it in a later slide. Uh, Rehypothecation. Uh, right. So in essence, Anna lends me the share. I sell it. The person who buys it can then lend it out to somebody else who shorts it. The person who buys there can re-lend it. Now, eventually that stock has to come back to Anna. This is common in finance and lending. And collateral is lent out and lent out. If Hung Wah's in here, Hung Wah actually is an equity finance guru. And he can probably tell us more about this than I can. Hung Wah, do you want to jump in at all? I don't know if he has his microphone. I'm going to jump Hello. in. I'm going to jump in here. I, my apologies, everyone. Hung Wah's got a pretty thick, like, East London accent. So I don't know if the the uh, subtitles are going to come through okay on this. but we'll So he's there. not a Chelsea fan, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, where do I start, Eric? Um, so, I mean, can you tell us, so just, I just want to introduce my friend Hung Wah. We've known each other for about, geez, I don't know, 10 plus years now. And I was his client in Hong Kong. He did equity finance, which is primarily stock lending. Um, worked for Barclays Capital and we're good friends. We talk all the time and he's someone I have a lot of respect for. He runs his own fund now. And if you could just tell us Hong Wah, a bit about like rehypothecation and how one share of stock can get lent out multiple times. Is that something? Yeah, sure. I, I kind of put him on the spot here. I didn't tell him I was going to hit him up. I didn't know this. Exactly. I didn't know this question was going to come. So rehypothecation, that happens at every single prime broker because frankly speaking, that's how we make the money. So we make money from hedge funds and from clients. So for example, if you want to say that Robin Hood is out there, in terms of commissions, um, in terms of lending the money for margin trading, and also as what Eric was saying in terms of rehypothecation. So in answer to the question which the gentleman asked earlier on, how could you short more than 100% of the float? It's actually quite easy without sounding in a sort of a condescending way, so forgive me if it sounds like that. Um, as Eric just said, you know, whoever buys you, so let's say for example, um, Eric lends his stock out and somebody goes and shorts it. So when they go and sell it, there's obviously going to be a buyer in the market. Um, that person can buy, put it into the brokerage account and re-lend it on again for a fee. And that chain goes down the line. So in this instance here, one stock, uh, which was originally bought, could be lent several times. That's how you get more than 100%. Um, the danger is that obviously when the recall comes, it's like, it's like a chain. So therefore, you've got to rely upon the whole chain going back the other way, which then uh, forces the price up, as you've just seen. Um, hopefully, that kind of answers your question. I think that's great. Anyone have questions on that? I have, I have one question. Um, my name's Corey. And I, why is there not a cap on on um, repopification? Re like why why are you allowed to go past a hundred percent? Kind of, Corey. For for precisely, uh, there I don't believe there's any. Certainly in Asia, there's no sort of rules and regulations about that because if I've bought my stock, be it Apple, whatever. Um, how do I phrase this? There's nothing stopping me from contacting my broker and say I want to lend out my stock to whoever wants to borrow it and I get a fee for it because it's like my stock is like my house is like my car it's my right to do that so whoever then borrows it from me they can then onset it to whoever wants to buy it and the whole process starts again 
Okay, so there is no limit. limit. Go ahead. Hongwa, am I correct in saying that if you wanted to eliminate rehypothecation, would you have to pretty much shut down all stock borrow? Or could you make it um, so that a share could only be, I, I mean, would you be able to make it so a share could only be lent out once? But then once it's yeah. lent out, the person who buys it, then. You can't, you can't, that's the whole thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Eric. Um, and then also, again, to Corey's question, yeah, you can't do that. The only way you can stop that is if you contact your broker and say, you do not want your shares to be lent out. Yeah, Eric, it's, it's, it's got to be like the Christmas gift exchange. You know, the third one, it's over. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. All right, anyone else have any questions for Hongwa? He's still going to be here, so it's not like he's going anywhere. By uh, lending it, are you putting a floor on your losses? Say that again? By lending it, are you effectively putting a floor on your losses, right? Because you're lending it out to somebody else who takes over that infinite part of the graph? No, but so you as the owner of the stock, the purchaser? No, so I, Anna owns it. I borrow, I short, I borrow, right? And then I'm lending it out again, right? No, no, no. As you, you are a borrower. You are not a lender. Oh, okay. So you borrow and you short. If I purchase your short, I'm now long the stock and I can lend it out. Okay. So in theory, I guess, Hungwa, Aaron could borrow Anna's share sell it to me. I then go and put it in the stock lending program. Aaron borrows my share and sells it again. That's exactly how it works within the banking community. Absolutely. At some yeah, point in the beginning, doesn't, doesn't somebody have to have to put in money to cover what they're about to do? Well, this is, I think, where we're going to talk about this in a bit when we get to things like the DTCC. And we're going to talk about some conspiracy theories and everything like that. Michael, let me see what Michael wrote. Hypothetically, could the same commodity be recirculated infinitely among the same people? Or can our systems detect such patterns, even if they allow for it to happen? I mean, I guess it could be recirculated infinitely, right, Hungwa? Well, within commodities, I don't know. That's not my expertise. Within equities, absolutely. It could be so-called many, many times over. Ultimately, um, the prime broker or the broker has got to make a commission from you. You've got to be paying something. So if you're paying zero commissions, how are they going to pay their lights? So by lending out your stock, they get a fee and they take their cut, like an agent's fee. That's how the prime brokers get paid. Tom's question, and this has nothing to do with the profitability of the company, right? Absolutely. This, these are, again, the kind of technical reasons. Because Shawnee's question, isn't that what happened at Robinhood? We'll get to that in a bit. Let, I, I don't think that's quite what happened. So my question is, how did this become a crusade? So if someone says, hey, you know what? A lot of people are short. There's probably a big chain given 140% of the stock has been shorted. There's a chain. A lot of people have short exposure. As Michael pointed out, you've got potentially infinite losses. You have a small company. It's going to be a lot easier to push the stock around. Okay, maybe this is kind of a perfect storm to create something like a short squeeze or Maybe it's not even a short squeeze. Maybe it's just a good old fashioned margin call. Adam? Yes, I had a, a question. If the stock is getting sent down the chain through all these short selling, mm -hmm. what happens if, I mean, is, it, or is the, I guess the responsibility for me for shorting the stock, am I only responsible for that one link in the chain? Or if it goes down and then comes back up, can I cover my, my own tail? You borrowed, you borrowed one share of stock mm -hmm. and shorted it in the market. You owe one share to somebody. Everything else in the chain is not your problem. Okay. If so your bank tells you, hey, Adam, the person who lent you that stock wants it back, you either have to purchase the stock in the market, no matter what the price, that's mm -hmm. a recall, or just go and find someone else. 
oh, hey, Kashani's got the stock, borrow it from her. Okay. And then, so you, give it, and then no you have a new contract with Kashani where you owe her the stock instead of owing it to Anna. Okay. In reality, it's the bank that manages all that. And plenty of times as a customer, someone shorting, you don't even see that. That's Hung Wah's right. job. Right. Hung Wah's got 10 clients. One client wants all their stock back. Oh, okay, no problem. And he borrows it from the other nine clients. And, and that so goes on that, that fee pretty much protects the financial institution from in case something happens, right? Like they, they still have to get that guy his stock back, right? Like somebody has to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. And that's, that's, that's the customer, right? Right. If, if Hung Wah calls you up and goes, hey, mate, there's no more stock to borrow. Anna wants her stock back. And I know you shorted it at $50, but it's $500 a share now. So you owe her a stock in three days. What's your plan? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go in the market and buy it back if you can't find someone else to borrow it from. Okay. That's, that's a recall situation. But in that kind of situation, we're going to talk about this. The price, the rental fee for the stock goes through the roof, 100%, 150%. Right. That never happened with game stock. Game stock has always been 15 to 25%, even in the past week or two weeks. So that's why, based on what little I know, I don't think this was a recall situation. I think it was just, you're short the stock. Oh crap, it's gone from 50 to 150 to 250. You're losing a hell of a lot of money. Uh, is there a recall? No, you can borrow all the stock you want. You want to short more? You can. You just got to send us another $5 billion to cover your potential losses. Um, now, what I find interesting reading the memes, the Reddit thread, et cetera, et cetera, this has kind of become a crusade, right? Sticking it to the man. Has GameStop become a crusade against establishment, billionaires, hedge on 1%? They're all pretty much the same thing. What do you guys think? Yes. Who said that? Corey. Corey, why? Uh, I think people still have a, a sour taste um, and they're left in their mouth from like the 2008 crash, um, especially with the COVID. Uh, the financial gap has been widened and there's been mm -hmm. the largest transfer of wealth ever recorded since the COVID breakout. So I think um, people are looking for a scapegoat or um, just someone to, to for, for a whipping post. Totally agree. Anyone heard of the Gini coefficient? No. Gini coefficient is a measure that measures wealth inequality. In the US, so what country has the highest Gini coefficient? Lesotho, oh wait, sorry, let me share my screen. I do this in class all the time and I go off dropping pearls of wisdom everywhere. And then 10 minutes later, people are like, uh, we can't see what you're seeing. Gini coefficient, closer to one is bad, unless you're really, really wealthy, right? Closer to one means massive wealth inequality. Closer to zero is more equality. So countries with wealth inequality, Lesotho, South Africa, Haiti, Botswana, Namibia, right? Think of these countries. Those of us who are old enough to know about the Duvaliers in Haiti, right? You basically have all these, like a handful of super wealthy people and then everyone else is really poor, right? I lived in Hong Kong, Hong Wan knows Hong Kong, massive wealth inequality. Now you look at, where's the US? The US, 0.48. In 1990, it was lower, 0.43. So it is getting less and less equal. The rich are getting richer, the poor are falling farther and farther behind, right? And they do things like this. The top 1% made that, that I have a million stats on this. Many European nations have low Gini coefficients, Slovakia, Slovenia, Sweden, maybe it's S. Your country starts with S, that's good, who knows? right? Here's a chart of them. I can't be right. That says 0. 0.6. US isn't 0. 0.6. Right? So this goes to Corey's point. Yeah, people are pissed off, right? If you've ever heard of something, my personal favorite, 
or Tom, cold countries, the primary dealer credit facility. This was a hedge fund bailout last year. And they basically said, this is the Federal Reserve, hey, if you buy stocks, you bought GameStop at 250, give your share to the Federal Reserve, they will give you $250. If GameStop goes to zero, yeah, whatever, you keep the 250 bucks, buy yourself something nice. The Federal Reserve will keep the share of stock. If the stock goes up to $500, you give the Federal Reserve 250, you get your stock back. That's a free option. Hedge funds got a free option. They should have something. Like something like that. The chicken tendy dealer facility for all these Redditors who bought GameStop. If they wanted to be fair, the Federal Reserve should say, hey, all you guys living in your mom's basement, we're going to buy all of your stock back at what you paid for it. And if it goes up to a thousand bucks a share, you can have it back and sell it. Right? They're not going to do that. This again goes to Corey's point. This is why people are pissed off. And I think rightly so. Any other thoughts on this? So Eric, when, when was the last time a phenomenon like this occurred or anything remotely close? Tulips. So a phenomenon like what? A, a, like mass, this, a, a this. larger margin call, a short squeeze, uh, people being pissed off at the wealthy or pissed off at the system. I mean, what, it's kind of a, it's a very broad question. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I guess all of the above. Eric, I think one uh, a good example would be the tulips. Um, that that was there was a short squeeze. I, I believe it was um, back in I think like the eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, and they actually shorted um, the tulips, the flower, and drove up the price. Yeah, I mean, if you if you're talking about you know, tulips are a different scenario. There, there may have been a short squeeze there. I can't remember. Um, tulips fall in the category of like a speculative mania. So the tulip mania, the South Seas bubble in the 1700s, um, the dot-com bubble, um, you know, 1929. The, the, but GameStop isn't that. GameStop is a very specific one instrument um yeah I a, a good book is um devil take the hindmost which talks about it's a kind of a short history of speculative manias it talks about tulips i think they talk about the south seas bubble and a few others um you know i i, I think this just kind of boiled over and i i honestly i i'm just i'm fascinated by all this now to so I can't I can't really answer that question because it's it's so broad and I don't I'd, I'd have to think about that. I have a question. Do you think this will change how hedge funds run by having more covered trades in the future because of the power that social media can have, or do you think that they'll rely on some sort of stop like the, like occurred this time where they stop trading? I mean, it already has changed behavior. Um, a couple firms have said, yeah, we're not going to run shorts anymore. I mean, Muddy Waters is a fund run by a guy, Carson Block, and they do like deep, deep research. Hey, and he's uncovered some major fraud. Hey, this company is crap. We went out and talked to their alleged customers. These customers don't even know who they are. The company's claiming they've got $500 million of sales every quarter. And their top five customers have never heard of them. You know, that kind of does the market a disservice by taking them out. Because, you know, as we, when you go back to this, if you do a lot of research, you're comfortable having this red line as your payoff. But what's going to prevent, you know, a million people in their mom's basement getting pissed off at you for who knows what reason and running the stock up tenfold. Right? Do you want to take that risk on now? You now right, have with, with no risk. increase to the gain. Yeah. 
yeah, you're still like the stock can still only go to zero. You know, maybe you would buy calls or something to cover your, you know, your potential losses or something like that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it already has changed it. You know, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm fascinated by why GameStop has become this, like, you know, is this the, their line in the sand? So some of the conspiracy theories, Robin Hood is helping the big boys by banning or limiting buys. Well, Robin Hood certainly did limit those trades. Other brokers did as well. Was that to help hedge funds? Who thinks that's true? I think it certainly could be true. Um, I don't think it's legal for them or maybe it's in their user services or terms of agreement to use the platform, but to limit trading, um, I think that made it very clear whose side they're on in my opinion. Well, anybody else? I also want to highlight, hi, this is Corey. I just want to highlight that uh, Robinhood, 50% um, I think of their revenues derived from C Citadel. Um, so they're kind of, you know, pigeonholed to um, the pecking order of, of what Citadel says. Did I send you my meme, Corey, that I made on that? <laughs> you might have, but I, I don't think I've seen it. Oh, okay. I'll send it to you again. Um, let's, let's pull that up. Um, DTCC. So basically the way it works, and again, I'm not an expert in U.S. securities, the way it works, securities settle T plus two, which means, Hongwa, are you still on? Hi, Eric. Yes, I am. Okay. So T plus two. So I do a trade today. Today is what? Tuesday. On Thursday, two days after the trade, there is an exchange where I exchange cash and the seller gives me the stock, correct? That's correct. In the meantime, the broker has an obligation to put money up, right? Because this is all like the DTCC is, think of it as the central um, counterparty. And they ensure that all of the trades settle. And what they do is they require the brokers because all of you, you can't go and just start trading on the stock exchange. You have to go through a broker. A broker is licensed. They have certain capital requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Like escrow, as Tom says, to make sure that trades settle or that if one counterparty, one bank fails or goes bankrupt, it doesn't take down the whole system. And this is one of the criticisms of things like swaps, if you think of the big short, as opposed to listed futures contracts with this, right? The, what is the, the expression I love? If you owe the bank $10,000 and can't pay, you have a problem. If you owe the bank $10 million and can't pay, the bank has a problem. The DTCC is trying to reduce risk of counterparties failing and taking down the whole system. When a stock like GameStop is moving 50, 100% a day, they basically go, oh, okay, you know what? A normal stock isn't gonna move that much. If your customer buys a share of Apple at $150, the trade's gonna settle in two days. The stock's not gonna move that much in two days, so you only have to give us 10% of the value of it. I'm making the number up. Well, in GameStop, would, would the clearinghouse be comfortable only holding 10% of the value of the trade given the stock's moving 100% a day? So the exchange, I heard, again, don't know if this is true, but I heard that they tripled the margins. Hey, you used to have to send us 10% of the value of every trade. Now you have to send us 35% because this stock is all over the place. We're concerned about liquidity. We're concerned about firms having outside risk. Again, this is what I've heard. So why are shares continue to be throttled? 
throttle, meaning not being allowed to trade? Well, yes, that are only limited to one, two, three, four, or five shares. Because the firm's probably not big enough to meet the capital requirements. If they had, I don't know how many people are on Robinhood, but if they had, you know, all of the all of the Robinhooders or all the redditors buying stock, and the exchange has now tripled the margins. Remember, Robinhood doesn't charge you commission. And Hungwa, as I understand it, the funds deposited at the DTCC have to be Robinhood funds, not customer funds. Um, and also the question is, I don't know. Um, that's a back office function, but you can't use customers funds. They've got to be segregated. So um, it would lead me to believe, yeah, the, the funds have to come from uh, the broker until settlement in which they debit your client's account. Okay, so that, that's a potential explanation. Obviously, it's a lot better to be like, they're trying to screw the little guy. Is that true? Well, wouldn't increasing the margin just uh, decrease the demand exponentially? So as demand continues to rise, they continue to increase the margin, which would then slow the demand for it, which would then you know lower the volatility of the stock, not, and then thus not having to actually limit but the amount of shares being purchased. But you as the customer, if you're not trading on margin, margin means you're borrowing money to buy stock. If you have $1,000 in your account and you go, oh, it's a 200 bucks a share, I wanna buy five shares. You're like, I'm fully funded. I should be able to buy the stock. But now Robinhood says, oh, we're gonna buy $1,000 of stock for Corey and the exchange goes, oh, okay, well, you have to send us $400 of your own money, Robinhood's money. And they're like, well, wait, like this dude's got a thousand bucks and he's using it all. We're not even charging him commission. Mm -hmm. Right, so here, here's what Aaron put. Um, Robinhood has to pay customers who are owed money from trades while posting additional cash to its clearing facility to insulate its trading partners from potential losses. And this, this is like the main function, the main benefit of a centralized clearinghouse, right? And this is why this whole chain, my, um, again, if, if you watch the big short, my ex-girlfriend worked, you know, Ryan Gosling, my ex-girlfriend worked for his group and people would call her up and like, oh, I've got a trade that I wanna offset but it's against Bear Stearns. And they're like, uh-uh, we're not taking that trade. Bear Stearns is gonna go bankrupt. So you might have had a trade that you did with Bear Stearns that was gonna make a bunch of money, but you can't get out of the trade. So next point, short squeeze. Well, based on what we said, the borrow rates never really exceeded 20% annualized. That's not very high, especially for a stock that's moving 50 to 100% in a day. There was always stock available from what I could tell, from what people had told me, and it was 15 to 20% annualized rate. If you're gonna short a stock that's moving 15% or sorry, that's moving 50% a day, are you willing to pay one to 2% a month to borrow it? Yes, no, does that seem cheap, expensive? Depending on the fees, right? The trading fees from broker fees, like, wouldn't that just well, No, like your, your borrow fee is only one to 2% a month and the stock's oh. gonna move 50% a day. Yeah. Oh, I missed it, should I inverted the numbers, sorry. <laughs> right? Like shit, I mean, I'll need to borrow the stock for four hours, right? So this maybe is just, the kind of margin call. Hey, a bunch of people shorted the stock at $25. It's now at $250. We go back to this. I sold the stock, we'll call this 25 bucks. And now the stock's at 250. I have an enormous loss. That's possibly a better explanation for what's going on. Any other conspiracy theories before we move on to some of the questions you guys asked? 
the Illuminati. Can you, or... can you explain uh, dark pools? Yeah, dark pools are um, a way for people to transact anonymously. If you and have a large legal? amount to buy or sell, and you call Hungwa and go, Hungwa, I've got like a shitload of stock to buy. Hungwa's a great guy. He's very trustworthy. But maybe Hungwa's colleague who sits next to him hears that. And he calls his buddy. Hey, I hear there's a guy trying to buy a ton of GameStop. He's buying like absolute tons. You should go buy some for yourself. Well, that's information leakage. Technically illegal, but it happens all the time. Right? Three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. A dark pool, you just enter it in the system. I want to buy a million shares of Microsoft. And if somebody else is in there and says, I want to sell a million shares of Microsoft, boom, that transacts. Nobody else but, sees that it's that someone wants to buy and someone wants to sell. That if price wants to sell it then nothing happens. That price is not the market price though, correct? No, it depends. You can put in whatever constraints you want, right? Apple's at what, 135? If I want to say, if I, I could say, I want to buy 100 million shares of Apple at 133, it would just sit there until people started selling it to me. Mm -hmm. And will it close? Like, can you have a partial closure? Like, you know, if you want a million shares and you only get 800,000? You can put whatever, again, I mean, I was doing this 10 years ago when this was starting out. You could put whatever constraints you want. I want to buy 10 million shares, but it has to be a minimum of half a million or a minimum of a million. Uh, okay. or I will only buy all 10 million. Okay. So whatever kind of constraints. You and want. and how, how did uh, this, like, when did dark, uh, dark pools be, arise and, and how did they weasel their way out of, uh, to become legal? Well, there's nothing that should be illegal about it. I mean, I was doing it in 08, 09 in Europe. But wouldn't you want complete transparency in the markets? Well, the, the trades, after you trade, it's reported. There's something called time and sales where you can see trades that happen. So the trades would be reported. But if I want to buy 10 million shares at a certain price, no one else should know that necessarily, right? Once I do buy them, sure. Okay, you have to report that to the market. Aaron says, Tootsie Roll going to merge with GameStop. I wouldn't call that conspiracy theory. I think that would be market manipulation. Aaron, it was called I, a joke. <laughs> it's called what? It was a joke. Yeah. No, I, I think Aaron's <laughs> trying to get out of her, uh, her long Tootsie Roll position and she's- uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to pump up the stock. <laughs> Uh, Anna, da, 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 da. okay. Um, all right. So now some of your questions, and I we can't get to all of these. You guys had awesome questions, and thank you very much for taking the time. Are short sellers manipulating the market? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe the the buyers were manipulating the market. Who knows? Um, why is Robin, we talked about that. Why did Wall Street bets to decide to invest in a company that's going out of business? What was their goal to invest in GameStop? Well, I think they saw, as we discussed, I think they saw technical reasons why the stock was susceptible to a run up. A large short interest, a small stock. When I say small, I mean in terms of the total value of it. If you wanted to run up Apple, Apple's worth, what's the market cap of Apple right now? I don't even know off the top of my head. Apple is worth uh, $2.2 trillion. If you wanted to move the market in Apple, you would need to have an absolute ton of money, right? It's much easier to do it with a little company than a big one. A Reddit user's breaking any kind of law, as Homer Simpson says, that's for the courts to decide. I don't have any idea. It's fascinating. Um, how did they bankrupt a large hedge fund? Great question. Um, that, hold on, let me get back to my meme stuff. And I'll, there's, a, there's a good meme in there. I love memes. And this proves the value of memes. Where's my thing?
Uh, here we go. Institutions retail. You can't YOLO everything because, uh, you know, risk management. Uh, Melvin Capital blows up a $10 billion portfolio in a single position. Yeah, risk management. Risk management, a lot of people suck at risk management. Pretty much any question you ask, I can answer with a meme. Oops. Oh, there we go. Gamification of Wall Street. This is a good one. Um, those of you who've taken my other classes and my personal finance class, the big thing when we talk about personal finance, the democratization of credit. FICO scores, et cetera, came about because back in the day, you would walk into a bank and they would judge your credit worthiness on what church you went to, the color of your skin, whether you lived in their neighborhood or not, something like that. Things that technically did not apply to whether or not you were likely to pay the loan back. Things like FICO scores solve that problem. Hey, we're just gonna look at, does this person pay back their loans? Do they make money? Doesn't matter the color of your skin or your religion or whatever, right? That's the democratization of credit, opening credit up, opening credit up to the masses. Gamification of Wall Street, opening up Wall Street to the masses. I liken this, obviously we're in California, so there probably aren't many people who are pro-gun, but imagine if we were all pro-gun. Yeah, everyone should be able to own a gun. Okay, cool. And then I go out and I mail a loaded pistol to everyone in California. What's going to happen? A lot of jail time. Not letting my wife check the mail, that's what. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. Right? A lot of people are going to shoot themselves because they don't know how to use the tool that has been given to them. And I do, I've been doing volunteer financial counseling for almost 10 years now. And I cannot tell you how many people I've worked with who are just like, oh, yeah, oh, cool. I've got access to credit. I'm going to go and buy a bunch of stuff. And now they have fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 of credit card debt that they're paying 20 to 25% interest on. You open these tools up to people, that's great. But if you don't give them or allow them to have the knowledge, they're going to shoot their faces off. Right? I mean, look, what happened to GameStop today? The stock closed at $90. It was down $135 today. Five days ago, the stock was at $350. Right? Someone in this room, possibly Hungwa, is long from 450. I'm just giving you shit, Hungwa. Right? You know, the, 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 like I mean, I, I'm on this Reddit thread. I don't know if anyone else is, but this is fascinating. The stuff that people are talking about, like you know, and then you see all of these questions, and I know a decent amount about options, but you see these questions, and you're like, this is not how that works. That's not how any of this works, right? And this is scary and it's great. I think it's great that people are investing. I think it's great that people are thinking about stocks and their future and stuff, but man, this is not a video game, right? And I mean, when the dust settles on this, it, it's gonna be ugly for some people, right? I, you know, there will be people who get yachts out of this, but it's gonna be ugly for people. Have hedge funds already covered their positions for, uh, I think the latest thing, it's something like 40% is the short interest now in GameStop down from 140. So yeah, a lot of them have. Is media manipulating people into silver? God, I hope so. I'm long a ton of silver. So I hope they manipulate the hell out. Buy silver, all of you. Buy as much as you can. Borrow as much money as you can and buy silver. No, that's not investment advice. Don't do that. Just joking. Um, how has trading changed from when you started two decades ago? Yeah, I mean, it's just like 
it's more electronic, there's more machines. You know, this stuff with the high frequency trading, HFT, that has totally changed the market. How that is legal is beyond me. I talk about this every semester. You know, companies like Citadel buy Robinhood's order flow, they buy Ameritrade's order flow. You know, I used to be a market maker in pharmaceutical and chemical stocks. And if a customer said, oh, I'm gonna buy, I wanna buy a bunch of this stock. If I went and bought some for myself before that, totally, totally illegal. How that's okay in a kind of all electronic context is beyond me. Um, index funds, there are, so here's something that's fascinating. Index funds, and apologies if we don't have time to go into all of this stuff. So just muted myself, nicely done. Uh, what is it, XRT? S&P retail ETF. 20% of it is in GameStop, or was, because it's just an ETF. So it's like, okay, you know, we have to buy whatever the computer program says, the, the mathematical calculations, right? And this is something we talked about in depth in my class. Like the idea behind ETFs is great. Hey, you know what? There's somebody smart driving. I don't need to drive. I can just be a passenger. That's cool. What if everyone's a passenger? Who's driving the bus? Eventually it's going to get to the point where no one's driving the bus. And then what happens? Who knows? Hopefully it doesn't go off a cliff. Um, what's your Venmo? Can I send you money? Yeah, hundred percent. No, that wasn't a real question. I put that in. Uh, inflation. Don't have time to talk about that now. Rates ever going up again? Everyone says no. Every single person, myself included, thinks no. So in my mind, that's the easy trade. Uh, but by the way, if anyone ever, ever, ever tells you the easy money has already been made, you can slap them in the face. Well, it's never easy. Oh, yeah. GameStop shorted at 300 and it goes down. Uh, easy money's already been made. Oh, yeah, it was easy to short GameStop at 300 when it was going up $100 a day, right? There was talk that it was going to 500 or 1,000. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. The people who bought the S&P in 2009 at 700, that was easy. No, it wasn't. The thing was falling like a knife. Right? That's never easy. What other things affect the market? Poof. One of my memes, who's really behind this market manipulation? Who is that? Yes, Peter, Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, right? They're the ones who manipulate the market. Congress is going to have a bunch of hearings and do you know, stupid stuff like Congress always does. At the end of the day, the Federal Reserve just sits there and pumps out money, never lets the market fall, bails out hedge funds, bails out banks, whatever. They're the, re they're the root of all evil in my mind. I won't go I've got more like anti-Federal Reserve stuff, but we will, we'll, we'll save that for later. Um, it's eight o'clock. I don't want to keep everyone. Um, my class is Tuesday night, Intro to Investments. I teach a couple other classes personal finance this semester at El Camino and intro to business at Santa Monica. Um, I'm available at either one. You can email me. Um, so normally the class is three hours on Tuesday nights. We take a break halfway through and then go from, we go from basically seven to 10. And I, I usually sit around a kibitz with people for another half an hour or so. Um, anyone have any thoughts, questions, comments? Was this, oh, Oh, let's do some polls again. Malia, don't go. Don't go. Okay, I won't go yet. Okay. Relaunch. Hold on, let me take photos of this stuff. All right. Now, poll. How do you feel about short selling?
Also, we have Professors Pacioretty and Steinberger here. They're awesome. They're both at SMC. I think Professor Chow from El Camino left. But he teaches uh, business and finance classes as well. I thought it was time for Tom to pitch his classes. No, I've muted Tom. Perma mute. <laughs> I got to see on mute here. Yes, I'm, yeah, I'm here just... to pitch your classes. I was here to support Eric, and I'm here to tell you. Um, how do I how, how do I do this? Uh, both Eric and I went through uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Uh, so I'll pitch that uh, a, a, a program about teaching at community colleges. The professors were outstanding, and one of the one of the, the the final projects was that of becoming an intern. So you had to be an intern to someone who's teaching a class, and so that's how Eric and I met. Gosh, it must be like five years ago. But the stuff that Eric knows. Jeez, I'm just, I got so many things going through my head, but he answers them so easily. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do that because of derivatives. And oh, by my friend, my friend from London and Hong Kong, we could do that. That's the value of an Eric class. Just pitching that. Thank you, Tom. So I'm going to put the stats in here. Eric, I have one question it's Corey by the way um so we were talking about market manipulation and one thing that came to mind was uh bill ackman um a couple a number of years ago um he was talking about how um retail retail companies are just going to die during the pandemic mm -hmm. um actually it wasn't a couple of years ago but regardless he uh he was you know creating a doomsday kind of scenario um on on cnbc and then that same day was buying uh, millions of dollars uh, in stock. And how is that not That's market? True. I, I believe so, yeah. Um, and how is that not market manipulation? Um, yeah, that, look, that sounds like it to me, but. And, and when it comes to actually being held accountable, how come it, uh, the SEC takes a cherry pickers kind of approach to it? instead of a, 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 a wide-ranging kind of holistic approach. I think the SCC is not very good at their job, so. So is it just kind of a sham in a way that, oh, uh, you know, almost virtue signaling? Look, I, I, can't, I can't say if it's that or not. I just, you know, look, I, I worked in the markets for several decades, and if I were in charge of the SCC, I think I'd be able to, like, nail tons of people. Right. But look, it's not just the SEC, right? HSBC launders money for the Mexican drug cartels. And what happens? Does anyone go to jail for that? No. Well, no, it's because the, the company the, the, pays the fine. The company yeah, exactly. is the shareholders. Like, well, no executives went to jail. No, like, in my mind, you should be like, okay, whoever's the head of the Mexican branch, bring him here. Yeah. Well, and, you know, what, what they actually get in return is always larger than the actual fine. So, is larger so than, than the actual fine. So yeah, the exactly. money that they, they make business, HSBC, exactly. JP Morgan, like, uh, you know, we paid $6 billion in fine on 20 billion in illicit profits. See, see, and then, and then this is the problem where I run into is that people kind of lose faith, faith in the institutional um, structure of, of the financial markets where, you know, we are. We always know that you know it's harder for like the little guys, the small fish in the pond. Um, but how do you like re reestablish the faith in in financial markets when people get so discouraged? Um, I, I mean, look. I you know m my opinions are much like with consumer credit. Sorry, I'm just popping the results in. Um, you have to roll back a lot of what's happened over the past few decades. You have to get rid of the high frequency trading. You have to get rid of front running. You know, there's, what is the purpose of financial markets? They have strayed so far from their purpose that, you know, what they accomplish now is not at all what they were meant to accomplish. You know, now it's kind of a casino. You look at the bulk of the trading that takes place day in and day out. You know, it's, it's not, 
genuine buyers looking to buy something and genuine sellers looking to sell something. The bulk of the trading is, you know, fast money looking to buy something and sell it for two cents higher. Mm -hmm. A lot, and it's kind of interesting, having worked all over the world, you see markets like Japan used to basically trade from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then they would take a lunch break and then they would trade, what was it, Hongwa, like noon to two, something like that. So they that's have, right. That's right. They would have two two-hour periods. Well, the market's open four hours. Where do you think all of the volume takes place? It takes place at 8 a.m., noon, and 2 p.m. You could literally have a market that just had four auctions a day. Hey, you know what? I like Apple. I'm going to buy some Apple. Okay, we're going to have an auction at 9 a.m. We'll have another one at 11 a.m., and then we'll have two more maybe a little bit of trading, you know, but in my, in my mind, either a market should be open three or four hours a day or shit, just make it like Bitcoin open 24 mm seven. -hmm. Uh, Eric, may I just jump in to answer one of Corey's uh, questions? Please. Um, Corey mentioned, and I'd just like to pick up on that. Now, how is a little guy um, supposed to have faith in these markets? That's, I believe that's one of his questions. And I'd like to say every, to everybody on the, on the call today, um, the answer is Eric, really. I mean, I'm not trying to big him up or anything like that, but he is an intellectual leviathan. This, this is the guy who has, it, who has Eric fan club as his, as his name in the chat. Come on, I'm <laughs> No, but it's but it, but it is, and I think compliments are, are, are due when when it's actually due because it's always very easy to criticise somebody if they've messed something up. But it's always people are always very slow to to give compliments where it's due. So, in answer to to Corey's question, how is a little guy supposed to compete? By asking your peer group, by asking people who know, by asking Eric. You know, um, he's very patient. He'll he'll explain things fifteen different ways of Sundays. Uh, until you get it. So I think in answer to Corey's question, the only way the little guy is able to, able to compete is to get educated. I'd like to leave it as that. All right, Hongwa, what's your Venmo? I gotta send you some money right now. <laughs> well, that's, that's not why I brought the, <laughs> you know, but, but thank you, Hongwa, Tom, Aaron. Um, any other questions before we go? It's, look, it's tough. You know, and it's, it's like, I mean, you guys see it. It's a gamification. And I mean, I don't know how this is going to shake out. I mean, this stock's down 60% today. What's going to happen after, you know, a bunch of people get burned here? I don't know what the hell's going to happen. People are going to be pissed off, and rightly so. Um, hello, I have a quick question. Yeah, who's this? Sorry. Hi, Shannon. Shannon. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question um, since uh, back to what Corey was saying about, you know, the trust and uh, the U.S. market is, is, is kind of failing with, um, I guess, retail investors, in my opinion. Um, so do, what do you think about emerging markets in other countries like uh, Asian countries? Because if they seem more, um, I want to say they seem more transparent in some, but um, what do you you're think saying, about those markets over there? You're, you're saying that Indonesia is a safer market than the U.S. and more trustworthy? Well, I'm not specifically pointing at Indonesia, just, you know, there, there are other markets to go to other than U.S. So for people who are kind of disillusioned with what's going on and what's been going on, and besides that, just, you know, the U.S. in general, kind of, I don't know, I don't have much faith in it right now, even though I live here, but I'm just wondering what is your thoughts on the emerging markets outside of the U.S.? So I just typed in the chat, Boomi was uh, an Indonesian coal company owned primarily by the Bakri brothers. This must have been, I don't know, 2011. Long and short of it, they owned a couple different companies and they had uh, a large stake in this company called Boomi, coal company in Indonesia. And they go to Credit Suisse and they say, we have $100 million of Boomi stock, will you lend us money? Credit Suisse goes, yeah, we'll lend you whatever, $60 million. And they go, okay, cool, sign a contract. Then they go to Goldman Sachs. I'm making these numbers and companies up. Hey, we've got 100 million of Boomi shares. Will you lend us money? Yeah, we'll lend you 60 million. Cool, sign a contract. They go to Morgan Stanley, same thing, right? Well, what do you think happens when Boomi shares start falling? 
Credit Suisse calls them up, hey, uh, can you give us that uh, $100 million of Boomi stock that's only worth 80 now? Goldman Sachs calling on the other line. Yeah, can you give us that uh, 80 million to Boomi? Morgan Stanley, oh, what happened? Boomi, the stock was closed for two months. The entire Indonesian stock market closed for two weeks. The entire market. Every single stock in Indonesia was suspended for two weeks. We're like, holy crap, right? This is an example of like rehypothecation and pledging collateral to multiple people when the chain starts to come apart. That doesn't mean Indonesia is not a great buy. I haven't looked at Indonesia, Myanmar, Malaysia. We made tons of money in those places. But you still deal with, I mean, places like that. Have you guys heard of this one MDB scandal? Right? Basically, Goldman was guilty as all hell in this, and they somehow got off with a small fine as usual. Right? But they, they were like siphoning money from the government, money that was supposed to go to the government, and a handful of people were just taking it. Right? These are, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, and, you know, in a normal market, this should be priced in and you should get a higher return. I don't know if that's the case now. I haven't really looked at the emerging markets, but it does make sense. I think your point is diversification and it does make sense to diversify. But again, I don't know the value, like, you know, what kind of PE these, these stock markets trade at, et cetera. I don't follow it that closely anymore. Okay, thank you. But again, when I, when I teach my investments class, the, the overriding theme is risk. There's no problem with taking risk. Just make sure that you are compensated for it. When I teach at Santa Monica, I'm on the second floor. Right? Would you, and I always say, would you jump off the second floor? You can land in the bushes if you want. Right? But the window doesn't open. No, 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 just at the edge near the stairs. Why, have you tried it, Erin? Erin's had a bad day teaching and she's like, oh, I'm gonna end it all. Maybe that's why the windows don't open. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking near the steps, you know, the back part of the building. I'm just kidding, yes. Right, would you do it? What if I said, I'll give you $20 if you jump off the second floor? And the bush looks like it's in good shape? Yeah. Okay. Wow, go on, Erin. That's what we call risk. More, more than 20 though. <laughs> behavior, right? What if I said, you have to jump off and land on the concrete? No way. What if I said, I'll pay you $25,000 and I'll cover all of your medical bills? I actually st you know, still wouldn't do it because I don't want long-term issues. What's, for a normal person, what's the worst that's going to happen? You'll probably break a leg, right? You might be okay. What if I said a hundred grand and I'll pay all of your medical bills? I have to, I'd still have to land on the bush. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Second floor, it's what? Like anyone do part? You had me at 25. Yeah, of course, like, oh, I would have done it at 25. You just offered me an extra 75, right? You know, that's the kind of thing that you know the risk. It's fine to jump off the second floor. You're almost certainly not going to die, right? It's not like I'm going to blindfold you and push you. You can sit there and do it when you're ready. So there's a risk. You know, the most likely consequence is nothing happens to, oh, maybe you break your leg. Okay. Are you being compensated enough for that risk? 25 grand plus cover all the medical bills? Or he's like, yeah, that's cool. Probably break a leg. I'll be in a cast for a few weeks and I got 25 grand. I'm not going to declare that on my taxes, right? It's equivalent to 40 grand versus doing it for $20. Well, there you're taking on a risk and you're not really getting compensated for it. So when you're looking at any kind of investment in emerging markets, or whatever, that's cool. Hey, you know what? Myanmar, right? That's a frontier market. Okay. What is the potential gain there? What is the risk? Well, the stock, I don't even know what their index is up. Emerging market indices are generally like telecom companies, banks, utilities, construction company, right? That's pretty much all frontier markets. Oh, it's up 500% in the last three years. Okay, well now maybe you've got some risk. Oh, the stock market hasn't moved in four years. 
well, okay, your downside's probably pretty limited. So anyway, these are things to think about when you're when you're investing. And this is this, you know, I Nathan's still here. I don't know if Nathan's still here. Some of uh, you know, some of the people who've taken my class in the past few years kind of you know, laughed at me. Oh, you're saying the Federal Reserve is the only game in town. Ha, ha, ha. No, this and that. Earnings are great. Da, da, da. Well, we saw a year ago in March, the stock market dropped 30% in two weeks. And what happened? The Federal Reserve had to come in and bail everyone out. If they hadn't, what, it, what would have happened if the Fed had been like, eh, whatever, it's not our problem. We don't control COVID. We're not the CDC. Where would the stock market have gone in April and May? It would have gone straight down. Yeah, it would have gone straight down. Mm -hmm. I had put options on some things. They went up tenfold. I'm like, they're going up 50-fold. Well, obviously, they didn't. But you know, for me, it's like, hey, that just proves my point. The Federal Reserve is the only game in town. All this BS about oh, increased corporate profits, da 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 da, and now we've got 15, 20 percent unemployment, and the stock market's on all time highs. Why? Because things are going to get better. They're going to get better than they were before COVID. We drive around and see all these places for lease. Why? Because everyone's buying crap off of Amazon that people are, you know, getting paid fifteen dollars an hour to work like they're in a Charles Dickens novel in an Amazon factory. I don't know. Whatever. I'm opinionated. My Eric, best I have Nathan a... says that's my opinion, and I'm almost I'm almost certainly wrong. Eric, I have another <laughs> uh, question. Um, when eighty percent of stocks are owned by, let's say, one or ten percent of of the of the people holding them, mm -hmm. um, do small retail investors actually have enough impact um, when they move together? Like, let's say, um, in, I mean, I guess for GameStop, for example, but I. I out, excluding GameStop, more more over in the overall market. I think what you're asking is that apes together strong. That's what people on Reddit have been saying, right? Yeah. Compare that to I can't remember was it Pope or somebody who said this is the interesting dichotomy. Every man for himself, devil take the hindmost. I think that, I, let me look this up quickly. I wanted to put this in my slide pack. I want to say this was from like the South Seas bubble. I'm just afraid that um, with, with the concentration of stocks in such few amount of people that uh, individual investors really don't have um, an impact or any real uh, buying power? No, but I mean, um, they do. I mean, th this GameStop showed us that they do. But this but is just a recent development, though, due to no, a popular no, I, movement. Well, I mean, it's always existed, but, there, you know, here, and this gets back to somebody's question, like, is this Reddit stuff illegal? There is. There are certainly laws around what are called concert parties. If we all get together and say, hey, we're going to do this, we're all going to buy this stock and we meet and we talk about it, we would be considered, again, I don't know if this is the rule in the U.S. or not, I would imagine so, we would be considered a concert party. We're working together. Well, let's say there are 42 of us here. If we all buy 2% of the stock, we now own almost the entire company. Well, the regulator would be like, no, 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 you're not 42 discrete separate individuals. You are working together as one. As such, we are going to treat you as one entity. So once your whole group surpasses whatever the threshold is, 5%, you know, you have to declare it. Once you pass 20%, okay, now you guys have to try and buy the whole company. You have to launch a bid for the entire company. You know, it's just now it's like, hey, we're a bunch of clowns on Reddit in our mom's basement. We don't even know each other. Well, one, have, one you seen, have, have you seen all these? I'm just, I'm just dying laughing. Like all these, oh, hold on, let me get my meme thing back. Well, one, when do they have to prove nefarious uh, intent 
court I, I, like I said I, I'm not a lawyer I can't answer that right and, okay. and these are there are arguments on both sides and, you know I, second, I my, my so second I point is hasn't this been done hasn't this been done you know before you know um, you know, hedge funds or or um, you know market makers conspiring together to you know invest in the same industry. Yeah, but usually it's more like the people know each other, and that I think is is a much easier case from a regulatory standpoint. Okay, you six people got together and decided you were going to buy this, and you know each other. That's a lot different than. You know, here we go. This, this meme had me just cracking up today, right? right? These are some of the people on Reddit, right? And it's like, what are you gonna do? Go after this, you're gonna go after Piss Gremlin 69 and be like, you're conspiring to, you know, manipulate share prices? I don't know. So would you say that fundamentals aren't necessarily that important anymore? It's more of a implicit value or a perceptional value? I mean, I've argued that for a decade, for God's sake, right? The problems that we had in 2008 never got solved. I bought junk bonds after the market crashed at a 25% yield. They rallied 30%. I sold them and I was like, I'm the best trader in the world. And then they rallied another 150%. And I'm like, oh, shit. Nice we didn't make the first 20% and leave the other 200% for somebody else. Oh yeah, and Tom's point. Tom's point is always like, stuff's legal, it's illegal, whatever. But do you have the money to go to the mat? All right? You know, are you gonna go and file a lawsuit and stuff? I don't know. It's like these are fascinating things. It's fascinating times. I you know, again, I think the whole market's a joke, right? Fed comes in, bails, bails out big institutions. But whatever. I'm cynical. Do you ever see the stock market? That's why do people you, don't invite me to cocktail parties? Do you, what, do you ever see this? Uh, could you ever see the stock market ever being um, something like cryptocurrency, where it's uh, being able to trade twenty four hours a day and it's not uh, institutionalized? The stock market's just in. Well, uh, there's too much money in it for not to be institutionalized. It only it, it trades. You know, so the roots are just too like deep. 10 or 12 hours a day now, 60 hours a week. That's probably enough, don't you think? Okay, Eric. So what advice would you give to your students who do want to invest? What okay. could they look at? Ask me offline what I suggest and then go and do the opposite. <laughs> that is my advice. And that is like guaranteed win every time you will have a giant yacht and then just remember i believe it's the opposite of tom uh, per per this morning's trades <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. so um no i mean it look you know it's <clears throat> you know if you're young and you want to sit there and punt go nuts whatever i don't I, the actually that's a great question here the advice i always give people so i i knew a guy who had a successful like a digital marketing company. This was uh, two years ago. And he and his brother came and presented to Tom's class. And Tom's like, wow, this guy really knows his shit. And he did. He's good at his job, had his own company, da, 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 da. And so I'm talking with him. He's like, yeah, so I'm going to get into day trading. I'm like, really? What's your plan? He's like, okay, well, I normally start my job at like 8.30, but I'm going to get up earlier, you know, get up at 5.30, spend two hours trading in the morning and then spend another hour trading. It's like, you're good at your job. You've got your own company. Put that extra three hours into your business, right? Because like once you stop trading, how much income do you have from trading? Zero. But if you build a business that can be self-sustaining it can pay you when you reduce your workload, when you retire, et cetera. You know, to me, it's just like, if you've got something you're good at, do that. Right? 
yeah, it's alluring. Hey, I'm going to buy GameStop at three dollars and sell it at three fifty to Hungwa. Hungwa, I don't. Even, did Hungwa? Did you really even buy GameStop, Hungwa? I'm giving you a lot of shit about this. I don't know if you actually did. There you go. Yeah, Calm yes, team entrepreneurship, right? Boom. There you go. Business sixty three, Santa Monica College. Tom Patriotti. He's your man. Don't forget me when you got that yacht. Eric, uh, can you explain a little bit about um, share buybacks and how that um, impacts the share? Now, does that just impact the earnings per share since the amount of outstanding shares have been decreased? Yeah, so the amount of shares outstanding decreases. So all things being equal, the earnings per share goes up. And all things being equal, it puts upward pressure on the price. They're notoriously companies. GE is the best example, right? They're buying their shares back when it's really high. The stock shits the bed and then they don't have any cash left and they're not buying shares, right? The airlines, my, this guy's awesome. Uh, Wolf Street, hold on. Wolf Street Airlines. This guy's based up in San Francisco. Um, he's great. He's actually cited, not me, but one of my students who did a project for me. Um, hold on. So his thing, they have spent 45 billion in buybacks over the last 10 years, the airlines, right? Now the shit hits the fan and they go to the government. Oh, Hey, we need, we need $20 billion as a bailout. That's BS. They should go bankrupt. You know why? To punish the investors. Because the investors demanded the money be spent on buybacks. If you were the CEO and you didn't buy back stock, the investors would have had your head. They would have chucked you out, hired a CEO who would do buybacks. Well, and we what percentage of their salaries also in stock? <laughs> yeah, right. They're obviously incentivized yeah. to do it. You don't want to lose your job lose that big salary and all the stock options and everything like that. But it's the shareholders demanding that. And so I think that's why they have to be like, hey, you know what, you're not getting any buybacks. What are you, you, guys what, had, you spent 45, or you're not getting any bailouts. You spent $45 billion over the last decade buying back your own stock. You bought it back at 50 bucks a share, your stock's at $10 a share now. That was a pretty stupid buy, wasn't it? Hungwa doesn't get bailed out when he bought his GameStop at 450. The government doesn't go, oh, you know what, Hung Wai? You spent all your money buying Game Saga 450. We're going to give you some cash to help you through. No, it's like, meh, you're on your own. What are your thoughts on CEOs' um, time horizons when it comes to like short, short-term goals as opposed to long-term goals and how that impacts shareholders? I mean, I can only speculate on that. I touched on that in an earlier slide today. Owners and managers have different objectives, different time horizons. In theory, I don't know, maybe shareholders don't. If the shareholders are high frequency traders, they don't give a shit what happens to stock tomorrow. That's tomorrow's problem. Well, wouldn't the CEO want, I mean, I know that when it comes to reporting quarterly earnings, they want, you know, to you know be as best as they possibly can, but then that might not be necessarily the best for the company in the long term, like buying back shares, as you said. Um, do you see any, any uh, divergence or any kind of um, a different path being taken or any, any, any kind of insight into that? I, I mean, look, I, I can't, I can speculate what CEOs do and why they do it, but I don't know. But I mean, isn't it I mean, like it, inherently- To me, share buybacks used to be illegal, right? In my mind, they should be. Right? You wanna pay dividends, pay dividends. But look, now but, companies are, are, you know, borrowing money to pay dividends. They're borrowing money to buy back shares. If you're borrowing money to buy back shares, all you're doing is changing the capital structure of the company. You're changing it from 50% debt, 50% equity to 40% debt or 40% equity, 60% debt, 20% equity, 80% debt. Equity, if you, if you look at sort of, you know, um, capital structure, capital structure, um, finance and things like that, equity is a call option on the value of the firm. So if you have a thin slice of equity, you have a call option on the value of the firm. And this is what 
what PE guys do with bailouts. Hey, we're going to buy this company, but we're going to buy it all with debt. So we're only in a little tiny bit of capital. We're going to put up $100 million and buy a $10 billion company. And then if the company is worth $12 billion in two years, hey, we put in $100 million bucks and we made $2 billion on it. What's a great return on investment? Aaron, great question. Why isn't the lender putting regulations on how that debt is used? Remember this term, covenant light, right? Again, the Federal Reserve has crushed interest rates. Interest rates are the price of money. Interest rates are zero, close to zero. Hey, you know what, Aaron? I'm a big company. I want to borrow money. I'm not going to give you any protections. If you don't like it, go lend money to the US Treasury. You can lend them money for 30 years at 1.4%. Or you can lend money to me at seven years for two and a half percent, but you don't get any protections. What do you want to do? I Again, get my commission. <laughs> They, they, they should be. Lenders should be putting regulations on how that debt is used. But, you know, in, in, a, in an environment where money is cheap, those protections go away because, you know, I mean, look, there, there's negative, there's like 15 plus trillion dollars of negative yielding debt. You give the German government a million dollars and they go, yeah, thanks for that. And in five years, we'll give you back what did I say? A million bucks? We'll give you back 990,000. The hell is that? That, that makes, that's, that, I don't think that's ever existed in history before that. Certainly not on any kind of like institutional scale, like who in their right mind? Well, Tom, you're, you're one of the like 1%, Tom, that doesn't count. You refine your house. I'm surprised they didn't pay you just to have your name on the like customer list. Tom Pacioretty, he's our customer. Right? The way banking should be. Anyone ever read A Tale of Two Cities? Right? The bank, Telson's Bank, I think is what it's called. And best I can tell, it's modeled on what used to, I don't think it exists, exists anymore. They got bought out. A bank called Coots. Coots was actually an unlimited liability corporation, which means, as far as I understand it, because they, the, they interviewed the, the CEO of Coots Bank when I lived in London. And he's like, yeah, people don't lose money until I personally am wiped out. Imagine the CEO of American Airlines. Oh yeah. You guys won't lose money. Bondholders won't lose money until I personally am wiped out. Would you feel comfortable lending them money? I would. Yeah. I don't take any losses until the CEO is wiped out, until he loses everything. That would give me a lot. I, you had to be invited to be a customer of that bank. I obviously wasn't. I wasn't rich enough, but my old boss was. Yeah, Aaron, yeah, you'd want to read the fine print, but that's that's the gist of it. Anyway, is that enough? I don't want to bore you guys. Uh, Eric, I have one other question. Any books mm -hmm. that you uh, recommend reading for financial literacy or kind of something that's in a little Taylor. past begin Taylor past Taylor. beginner, but nothing that's like too uh, taxing? I generally don't read a lot of books on finance. That's like my spare time. I read, um, you can tell stuff like Dickens and read a lot of French authors. One book that I think is great. <laughs> oh, um, so not the jungle. You guys have probably heard of the jungle. Um, oh. Adam, you probably remember. What's the name of the book? Um, God. Oh, The Money Changers. Mm 
It's you can get it for free on a Kindle. This book was written in 1908. Watch the big short and then read the money changers. And if you did not know better, you would think the money changers was written five or 10 years ago. It was actually written in 1908. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Any other books outside of financial literacy, like, you know, any self-help or not self-help, but self-wealth, you know, per, you know, like anything to diversify your intellect, maybe something like Brave New World or. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. I reread 1984 every couple of years. Coming more true and true every day. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I, I, I finished Brave New World recently, and, and that was kind of, uh, I, I became a little depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't read that in a long time. I should read it again. I, I probably shouldn't, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Tom recently read Animal Farm. He said, that's a great book, too. Yeah. But yeah, all those kind of things. Yeah, Atlas Shrugged. It's a great book. Have you read Barbarians at the Gate? Uh-huh. I saw the movie, which is very good, and I read the book. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of that one right now. Um. My, uh, my daughter, so those of you that talk about Atlas Shrugged, my daughter is named Kira, who is actually um, the main character. Oops, I sent that to somebody individually. We the Living is a book by Ayn Rand, which is pretty much an autobiography. And the main character is called Kira. And that's my daughter's name because of that. So that's a good book. But I find all of those things fascinating. But anyway, but again, you guys have my info. Um, I've got a um, Vimeo page that just has my um, my lectures on there per class. Uh, Dune. Wow, I haven't read Dune since I was a kid. Um, that's a good call. Um, Any movie with now reading it, and it's it's very stark as far as the minerals of the mine versus oil and i'm i'm seeing it with a whole new mindset yeah, i should reread those that's a good call it's, okay yeah, there's somewhere like my boxes and boxes of books uh, yeah really good like it's kind of scary about the correlation between um financial security trading of uh resources across the galaxy but it, yeah uh, interesting i gotta reread those i gotta reread those um but yeah any movie with sting i love you gotta you know I don't think there are many of them, but big fan of Desert Rose. Yeah. <laughs> if you see that stig one. <laughs> but again, this is this is kind of how we uh we run my classes. And thank you to whoever left me my first bad review on rate my professors. I was really uh really pleased with that. Um, but you know, whatever. Not everyone's happy. And you know, I understand this 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 format isn't great for everyone. So I tr I try to be upfront about that at the beginning of each semester. So my apologies to those who don't like it, but Professor uh, Shisaito teaches uh, like a more standard class. So I think that's some people prefer that. And it's just good to know what you're getting into ahead of time. Um, so, yeah. Well, thanks again, Eric. I appreciate it. Um, There's a lot of a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, info here. Well, thank you all. I appreciate you taking the time. I know it's a uh, it's a couple hours out of your night. Um, so yeah, uh, you've got my email. It's on there. I'll, I'll try and give, get everyone's email. I don't know. Tom's my, my guru on that, on the IT side. I don't know if I can extract everyone's email from it and then maybe send out a, like a thank you or something just, but I, you should all have my email. Um, and if you have questions, just hit me up again. I don't give investment advice, um, cause I suck at it, but whatever. Um, Again, thank you, everyone, and I appreciate it. And just hit me up by email if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Eric. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Thanks, Tom, Aaron, Hungwa, if you're still there. I don't know if Ian was around. I didn't see him. But, uh, but thank you, guys. Hungwa's still there? No, he's gone. He's gone.